The Hedgeless Horseman here. It's August the 23rd, 2024. It's actually August the 24th here in Sweden already. Uh, I will be going away for a week, week and a half soon. Uh, so I thought I would, you know, try to put out some videos, some content before I leave. Uh, uh, yeah, so first of all, thanks to the sponsors. Uh, in this video, I will focus on game theory or investing theory actually uh, but I mean they're, they're kind of the same things um, so we will look at or I will go through what specific characteristics or what type of junior companies I think probably provide uh, maybe the biggest opportunities given everything that's going on out there Given where the price of gold is, given what the different subsectors are trading at, yada yada yada. And I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna get to that. First, I thought I would want to show this picture. I think this was kind of funny. It's like, can you spot the calm, long-term focus billionaire hodl investor? You probably figure out that this is Robert Friedland. I I just really like this picture. Uh, I mean, compare this or let, let's. I mean, he basically, he, he shits on analysts, he shits on uh, uh, NPV, discounted cash flow models, and yada, yada, yada. Obviously, a long-term big picture guy talks about copper, that we're going to need more copper, and it's like just a matter of time before copper goes higher, and we need to start going now, and that, you know, uh, mines will basically, I mean, he talks about the phylo mining, for example, you know, how hard it would be to build up project at that elevation and all of that where there's almost no air and uh, basically that yeah that's gonna be i mean if people think that uh, philo mining's uh, project uh, is gonna come online uh, anytime soon uh, you're probably gonna have to wait i mean that goes for all big copper projects obviously i mean it just takes a lot long time to build anything today especially the massive ones but one once they're up and running of course they could go be going for decades or, or centuries uh that's the the beauty of them but he kind of points out i mean again the the responses from the mining sector i mean we're, we're so behind the ball and that goes for i think gold as well i mean gold is at two thousand five hundred dollars how many new projects are you seeing especially in the west that's like yep now we're gonna build this i mean uh, so far i don't think uh seen many at all and anyone that's really gone into you know is in production let's say or started i mean started a couple of years ago and it's already been in the pipeline but i don't see much in terms of reaction i i just thought it was very or somewhat funny uh that you have the guy that's just calmly sitting back watching the ocean with palm trees in the background some uh, uh you know uh, what do you call it? Uh, sh uh, shade, sh well, sunglasses, I guess. I was gonna say sunshade glasses. Sunglasses. You're sitting there, you know, not worried about a thing. Again, compare that to, uh, you know, the, you know, typical retail guy that posts on Twitter and all of that. You know, constantly worried, constantly guessing where the metals are gonna go in the short term. If, Gold goes to two thousand, uh, about two thousand five hundred. He gets really bullish if it drops down to two thousand four hundred and ninety, and he sees a bunch of tweets about oh the next next target price is lower as per usual. You know, completely whipsawing at all times. But this guy is like obviously he's he's one of those you know kind of like the Landines. I mean. He, he bets, uh, typically long-term bets, because he's not trading. And obviously, he's a billionaire, so it's worked out. It's just that, uh, of course, every bet takes years. I mean, just look at Ivanhoe Mines. It took quite some time before that really got going. But once it got going, if you look back, the returns were absolutely great, even though the stock traded sideways for like three, four years or something in the beginning. Then it started going, and it's, uh, I think, probably going to go up even more in the future. Um Again, compare that to someone who feels like he has to trade at all times. Uh, no, he seems pretty calm. He's not jumping out of the building. He doesn't seem worried about the market crash. He's looking at the fundamentals. Like, okay, we, we're going to need this much copper and we're simply not putting enough in production. So I think he's pretty, quite calm about it. 
so let's dig into it. So this is going to be, I think, a great setup for what we're going to talk about. Uh, no, notice, uh, yeah. Notice the question he asked, and then notice uh, the CEO of Alamos Gold's responses. Let's talk about M and A. Um, you know, you're saying that uh, you should be countercyclical, but uh, it doesn't seem that that's a trend right now. We've seen like a significant amount of uh, M and As that have been both in gold space, and we saw some uh, monster M and A uh, recently happening in the copper space as well, too. So mm. it seems like uh, we're at a point right now, I guess, where uh, you know COs are allowed to kind of stick their neck out as well, too. But it might not be the optimal time for doing so. Well, with well, f first, let's actually just break down this. So he previously said, you know, you got to be kind of counter cyclical in this business. I mean, that's kind of translation means buy when the typically the sector is crap. So you get cheap prices. Don't buy uh, when the sector is hot. Like, again, we there's a quite a few examples. The last time gold was really at new all time highs, <clears throat> excuse me, was in 2011. What happened then? Well, you see, saw a bunch of M&A. You saw Kinross acquire Redback Mining for new $9.2 billion from the Landines. Well, I think at the bear market bottom, you know, uh, four or five years later, I think Kinross as a whole traded down to like four or five billion or something like that. So, I mean, it's just immense value destruction because they paid a bunch of money uh, when gold had gone up for... 11 years straight basically that was not being obviously counter cyclical i mean they paid a high price for it uh so so that's what it's kind of implying it's like well we're seeing mna starting to pick up now that doesn't seem counter cyclical given where the gold price is but listen to his response gold prices running the way they are i mean the margins are just phenomenal right now so you've got that part of it you've also uh, there's a bifurcation in the market where um, non-producing companies are still lagging in valuation relative to the producers. And that differential in valuation is something that an acquirer can use to make acquisitions, even though the gold price is very high. It hasn't always been that way. you know. And so ba basically, as you can tell, he's saying that well, yeah, at face value, one would think that it's like gold at all time highs. Uh, last time anybody did acquisitions at all time highs, they, you know, paid whatever sum of money. And later on, they, you know, got kicked in the teeth for it because they wrote down 80 percent of the value. But what he's pointing out is that the, the breathtaking opportunity, and th that's obviously why I'm salivating and can barely sleep nowadays. He's pointing out the fact that the market is bifurcated, that the gold producers are enjoying fat profits because gold, the gold price is at 2,500 right now and inflation has not kept up enough. So the margins have disappeared. So he's saying it's very profitable to own a gold mine today. You're making a lot of money on a gold mine today. And he points out that the non-producing companies, aka the gold developers, or I mean gold exploration companies as well, but primarily the gold developers, they are not reflecting the value of the gold business right now. They are not reflecting the value their gold projects have at times like this. So basically, that, that's I, and I've been talking about this forever. It's like in 2015, I had to be a contrarian to buy gold developers ounces in the ground. Why? Because at face value, the gold projects were worthless, basically, because gold hit a low 1,048 bucks or something like that. How much were the gold developers, gold plays, um, their gold projects worth at $1,048 gold price, you think? I would say it's like no chance of being built, probably had zero or negative... <laughs> negative NPV at that gold price. So then you had to be a contrarian because they were super cheap, but that's was because the gold business was horrible. So if you were counter cyclical back then, you could pick up projects for peanuts, meaning that in most of the cases, if you're counter cyclical means that you're buying when the sector is hated, when it's having a tough time, 
uh, when when the gold price is low because that's typically when you find the cheap assets. He's pointing out that for some reason in 2024 that's not the case. Gold price is at record highs. The gold producers are making cash hand over fist and yet the developers are pricing in gold prices. You know, if you quote Pierre Lasson, like $1,600, $1,700. So you don't even need to be a contrarian right now. If you look at the price of gold only, you would think you're not a contrarian. But that's the beauty. That is why this is the most spectacular opportunity we might see in our lifetimes. For the first time, at least... Uh, since I've been in this sector, and if you listen to, you know, Ross Beattie and, and, and Eustra, they haven't seen it either. This dislocation between the value of gold products and the price that undeveloped gold products in the hands of juniors are uh, selling for. And he goes on to explain uh, or give some context. In the past, um, I can recall when gold prices started to run, little junior exploration companies used to do really well. We, mm -hmm. we raise money more easily uh, when we produce good results. You know, there's a big retail market that used to respond to those results. Um, it was very different back then, but with the virtual disappearance of the retail sector relative to the institutional side and the ETF side, um, it's it's a big, big struggle for mm -hmm. for non-producers for for exploration companies, and I think you're going to see more deals where producers will be acquiring developers as far as you know so he's basically as uh, as you can hear him say he, he basically suggests you know the disappearance of the retail sector and that's you know what he shocks it up to they're simply i mean the institutions can't buy these juniors they can't go out in these juniors i mean there uh, there might be an ask of five thousand shares or something who can buy that? And, and as many others have suggested, the juniors are too small for institutions to even kind of, you know, get into a private placement because they might want to take, you know, million dollar positions. And it's like, whoa, I mean, we can't even, you know, we, we're planning on raising two million and we already have 1.5 million lead orders from, you know, friends, family and whatever. It's like, uh, we can't, you know, let you buy in 10 million. We're too small. That would be our almost uh, our entire market cap or ho half our market cap. But that's the, that's the key ingredient here. The disappearance of the retail investor. It's the retail investor that is the only, uh, the only people small enough to trade these juniors in the open market. Typically, not every junior, but mostly. And this sector burns cash. So it constantly needs more money. So if there's very little retail interest, it means there's less and less cash going in and less and less money that buys up these stocks. So that's the only reason. Again, forget about the sector being rational. Forget about the junior sector being efficiently priced through all that. It's just simply lack of retail investors that have created this huge gap where you have the producers fairly valued, reflecting the uh, fantastic fundamentals, the f fantastic cash flows that comes from owning and operating a gold mine. Not every gold mine, obviously, but it's like the sector's probably had it better than it had in a long time. But thanks to the disappearance of the retail investor, projects, juniors out there are selling for freakishly low valuation. So he's pointing out that he expects more M&A because they're just that friggin' cheap. If, the, if you have products out there, a $2,500 gold, and even $2,000 gold, or even $1,800 gold, that's uh, trading for like 10 to 20% of the MPV, of their MPVs. And they can't do anything about it because they can't, most of them can't finance them. There's, again, not enough retail people out there. So it's like, yeah, would you be surprised that some of these producers, like, hey, we're making cash hand over fist here. Oh, that project is probably worth a billion dollars today. It's selling for a hundred million or something. Yeah, I think we're going to buy that. The sunk costs are probably a hundred million as well. 
especially you know if you add on a, an advanced product where they've done permitting or a far down permitting path like that saves them a bunch of years as well if they would have read would have redone that it would cost them almost the same amount they could buy the company for and they don't have to wait you know four years uh, to to have it go through permitting that is obviously it's like you know people ask me what to buy it's like well i'm a stock picker i don't I'm not interested at all in owning Barricks, Newmonts, or anything like that. I don't see the play there. I don't see the opportunity. In the juniors, listening to mo you know many billionaires like the Goose Trust, the Beatis, the Rick Rules, and uh, what have you. I mean, and Lassons, like they've never seen anything like it, and they have careers, you know, 30, 40 year long careers, and they haven't seen gold juniors be this cheap relative to the value of the gold business relative to the value of a gold mine, relative to the value of uh, uh, the, gold pr uh, the, the price of gold. So, okay, that is, it's like, again, I love investing theory, I love game theory. I want to set myself up to have the best possible risk adjusted returns, best risk reward, best opportunities at all times. Everything looks like a buy to me, basically. Everything that's decent, to higher quality, it basically looks like a buy. I mean, people can pitch me a stock, and it's like almost every time, it's like, yep, that looks cheap, that looks cheap, everything looks cheap. Uh, and of course, if you, if you, I mean, what I did in 2015, you know, I, I heard that, you know, the Sprouts and stuff, and the Keith Newmyers were talking, you know, the silver, silver in the ground has never been as cheap, you know, it's it's super cheap, and I looked at juniors, I was buying juniors that were down 90%, I actually, I literally got attracted, I, I had a spreadsheet, it's like, okay, how much are these producers down? It's like Endeavor Silver, I think I picked up when it was, you know, down 94% from the highs or something, it's like Bear Creek Mining, I even bought uh, Great Panther Silver, some First Majestic, Silver Standard, I own quite a bit of, so I was just looking what has been destroyed the most. And I heard, you know, say, oh, you know, ounces in the ground are selling for whatever, whatever. So I bought a bunch of ounces in the ground. I, I basically went full on beta around the bottom 2015-16. Then out of nowhere, the market turned and the portfolio went from first going down 53% or 54% in the first four months from me starting investing in juniors. So think about that. Everybody, you know, complaining, whatever. It's like, oh, you can't survive it. I mean, that was my first entrance to this sector. Minus 54% in four months. I would argue that's probably a quicker loss than many of you people listening here has maybe ever experienced. For that, And that was my, basically my entire net worth. It's probably much, uh, uh, well, okay, except for the flash crash. Covid flash crash maybe, but uh, you know, whatever that that turned around in a in a in a hurry and everything went down. So I mean that's a broad market sell off in that sense. Uh, so it wasn't just sent just sentiment related, if you know what I mean, uh, for the junior sector specifically. But so that was my entrance minus fifty four percent, kind of for my whole net worth in the first four months. That was again probably a bigger kick in the teeth than a lot of listeners and uh, uh, worse than a lot of people uh, on Twitter whining about the sector ever had. Yeah, they might be down minus 54% now or even more, but they never, I don't think, got that in the first four months of their investing career. And I only had, I mean, that was until the bottom. So it's like I hadn't really learned that much uh, before the sector turned around. But I, I understood at least, okay, I, I want to buy ounces in the ground. I didn't know anything about expiration, so it's like a good choice that I actually just went the very easy way of looking at what was literally down the most from the top and looking how many you know ounces of silver, ounces of gold, etc. I could buy. That was the kind of only metric, full on beta, and that portfolio, after it bottom, it went up 500%. Uh, and I, I, I just thought it's just a matter of when. It's just a matter of when. Keep buying. It just got cheaper. So, I, you know, I, I try to learn as quickly as possible. Uh, and that's one thing I think that a lot of people should really, you know, keep in mind. It's like you should never stop learning. 
uh, I, I'm not the same investor I was a year ago. I'm not the same investor speculator I was two years ago, three years ago. I think I'm getting better every year, every month maybe, because I continuously think about stuff, continuously try to understand what's important and what is not important. That doesn't mean I'm a full-blown geologist or a mining engineer, not even close. But some stuff you pick up, you know, okay, why won't this probably work? Okay, infrastructure, right, why is that important? Oh, backing, right, right. You know, stuff I never really thought about before. I just looked at ounces in the ground. Uh, so I would argue that many people here, maybe a lot of people listening to this, if you bought in this sector in the recent, you know, 2020 high, you had four, four and a half years to be able to continuously learn as the sector just got cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, future returns just kept going up and up and up. Assuming you also learned during that period of time, you would expect to have even higher future returns because you should be a better stock picker four and a half years into this uh, decline than you had when you bought into it. I only had four months before the sector turned. I, I wasn't able to learn that much. And of course, at, you know, at the uh, peaks, I mean, it felt like printing money. But okay, back to topic. Okay, let's again be a bit proactive here because I've said this before. A bear market is neither good or bad or a volatile sector is neither good or bad. It's depending on uh, what people do in it. Because if you have a... I wish I had the... Uh, I probably can't find... Anyway, I mean, you know... The, the typical shorts I've, you know, show Bear Creek Mining or, you know, Stellar Gold or whatever. It's zigzag, constantly zigzag, like up, up 500%, down 80 to 90%, up 500%, down 80 to 90%. And people will say, well, uh, you know, again, bear markets are bad. It's bad that th this sector goes down 80% and then always rallies. I mean, that's the reason why Pierre Lasson says this is the easiest sector in the world to make money on in because it always rallies and always crashes so obviously it's not again the bear or bull markets themselves it's what people do in the bull and bear markets if you're good at averaging down and increasingly averaging down the cheaper it gets you're never going to lose money in the sector over the long term assuming you don't bet everything on one or two companies or something and something like you know, company specific happens. If you can only average down and average down even, you know, months, years or whatever, uh, it's going to, you know, turn around. So to me, the volatility is the very reason why I think this, I agree with Pierre Lasson. Because at the lows, the future returns just get outrageous. If you have the stomach to average down, you're going to reap a very high profit. And the longer it stays down, the more you can buy, the more you've learned, the better you can stock pick, the more news you have seen come out from companies without getting rewarded. So it's kind of like being an insider because you see the news and it doesn't reprice. So you can buy it after the fact without paying up. I mean, the case just got better. Price didn't change. So it's like the opportunities, the quality of opportunities, the, the information advantage due to the lack of retail interest right now, for example, is obscene. So everybody that's bitching about it, they don't understand what's going on. So, and again, it's like, let's be a bit proactive. We, every, everybody bitches and moans about the junior sector. Oh, they're down, why aren't they going up? You know, they're not ecstatic at all. I mean, I can barely sleep nowadays because I'm so bullish. I have never seen anything like this. I thought 2015 was a layup. This is like orders of magnitude higher because now the actual gold business at, is at like record high value, but the prices are like at 52 week lows or multi-year lows. It's absolutely crazy. So again, let's be proactive. Same as a gold or a bear market is neither inherently good or bad. It's Good or bad, depending on what people do in them. Somebody can make a fortune in a volatile market, another one gets killed. It's not the market's fault, it's what people do in a volatile market. It's up to each and every one of us. It's our decisions. 
so instead of bitching and whining about how shitty the sector is and that nothing gets rewarded and whatever, okay, let, let's again be a bit creative here. So what do we know? What are the what's the playing field looking right now? Situation right now. High gold price, all time high gold price. We can check that quite quickly. Yes, as a matter of fact, the gold price is at record highs. Okay. Does that necessarily mean the gold business is doing well? No, it doesn't really because I mean here for example, I think that you know with the run uh, the the cost of the miners uh, basically kept up the pace. And then it crashed and the costs were up here and all you know many companies almost went bankrupt. Barrick had to sell a shit ton of assets and all of that. So we know the gold prices are at all time highs, but if we also look at the producers' margins and all that, like we just heard Alamos Gold CEO say, they are enjoying very high profit margins right now. So it's not only that the price of gold is at record levels, producers showing good cash flow, very you know, very high cash flow or margins, very high business value. Okay. So we know that the gold business in itself is very valuable. Mayors have cash flow, but I have very difficult time being able to grow. That's also kind of a given. Barrick produces, I don't know how many ounces per year, a shit ton of ounces, millions of ounces. How is it for them to grow anytime soon? How is it for, for them without help of gold price from here to grow 50% over the next three years? <clears throat> Pretty much impossible. And I'm not counting uh, mergers and acquisitions. Or I should say, I'm not counting them buying up another producer. They're just shuffling around the shares. Uh, they're going to pay a fair price for that. Yes, they might get something out of synergies or whatever. Uh, but that's not going to be 50% growth, right? And they and part of that is because permitting is difficult in the West. West. It's very, There are very limited options in terms of tier 1 scale mines. If we're talking just just at the, or if we're looking just at the production profile, there are very few mines out there that can produce four to a million ounces of gold a year. That's just ready to be acquired and ready to go. Very 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 few, and there's too many majors to go around. All of them can't grow fifty percent, and if they buy a hundred ounce uh, producer. Or pick up a project with 100,000 ounces of production. That's probably not going to move the needle for not not the majors. Uh, for the mid tiers, maybe, especially if there, it's low cost. So, so there's opportunity for smaller mines with you know good margins and all that to have a substantial impact. But still, overall, it's very hard to grow. That's why I don't like the majors. They're fairly priced and they have a very hard time of going up unless gold goes up. And if they go down, they're all of a sudden overvalued and they should probably go down. Mid-tiers kind of have the same thing. Have cash flow, but a pretty hard time to grow. Partly because, I mean, there's not, again, too many maybe obvious products, especially advanced products. I mean, there are not too many products where it's like, oh, we can buy you. And then in six months, we can, you know, start production. It's like fully permanent, ready to go, uh, big enough that this mid-tier, uh, you know, it will move the needle. No. Simply, uh, that's not the case. Yeah, so producers, especially the largest one, are quite fairly valued. Juniors are very cheap. Okay, yeah, that's what we got going on for us if we're junior uh, investor speculators. Backed up by the CEO of Almos Gold, who says that it's because uh, the retail investors have almost disappeared. So we have no competition out there. Because Yoshmo and your neighbor is out there buying, still buying Nvidia and, and Bitcoin and crypto and shit like that. That's either overvalued or extremely overvalued. Uh, we know that no risk ounces are selling for less than it costs to drill up. On average, I would say that's probably the case. It's like you can probably buy ounces in the ground in a resource which took X amount of meters, X amount of mil, uh, you know, whatever money to do a resource. And especially if they do an economic study, that takes years. It costs money. You could probably buy tier three assets at least for less uh, 
than it costs to uh, drill them up. And you're not taking any risk. You're not taking the risk that they will use the money but not find uh, a similar type deposit. That's why I only think really that most of the exploration place, if one wants to dabble in exploration, they should be obviously very, very cheap. They kind of have to because the opportunity cost is so high in the developers. But also preferably like legit shots at tier one deposit where it's like yep drilling costs but if they if it's a tier one deposit whatever it's like yeah i mean you sp you spend i don't know whatever fifty thousand meters drilling out something that's going to turn into a tier one deposit versus drilling up something or it's like uh half a decent project and you know uh, best case they're going to end up with a tier three deposit no so i mean it, you need to have a really good reason in my opinion to be an exploration company. You should be very, very selective. Only the best of the best. Because they have no beta. And they can kill the story before the turn comes. Uh, which is not the same for even a shitco beta play. Uh, at least as long as they can stay you know, above ground and not dilute the shit out of you. Uh, they're still going to revalue handsomely when the turn comes. Yep, and we also know, and you, you can just look around there, Exploration Juniors still have quite a hard time raising money, especially at higher and higher prices. Meaning that they take in money, they drill. So far, there's been, let's say, low reward even for success. And then the market knows that, oh, in order to keep going, they need to take in money again. So you don't have really, we haven't had the real uptick due to sentiment. Nobody's rewarding it. There's nobody here. So you can act like an insider. But then the market and the bankers and all of them, they know there's going to be a, a financing around the corner. So they're going to be front running that. They, they see, okay, they don't get really punished because there's no, not enough interest to reward the good results. Then they can basically start selling and then they can, you know, cover their shorts or whatever uh, in, in the private placement. So they've, they have a very hard time right now. If you're a capital intensive exploration play, you have a very hard time because you're barely getting anything for it for success unless it's exceptional success or you have very tight share structure or very strong backers. There are, there are exceptions. There are some explorers that are doing quite well. Uh, but they need to have all those kind of ingredients, which is not the case when the sentiment is very high. Then there's a bunch of retail people in and just buying up everything. It's like, oh, you, you talk about, you know, somebody throws out, oh, it could be billions of dollars here and somebody just buys off of that comment. So it's like it overwhelms. It's not a good idea to short typically because it's just the sentiment is on full greed. But that's not now. And permitting is difficult in the West. It's like, you know, the more CEOs I talk to, it's like, oh, geez, you know, my God, it's, you know, it takes forever. And it's like Pierre Lesson call it the killing fields that it used to be maybe one to three years of permitting. Now it's like three, four, five, six years of permitting. If you, if you even can get a permit and a junior needs to get, you know, if it, I mean, it's hard to finance yourself through five, six years of the bottom of the Lasson curve. That's just been extended in a shit poor, you know, retail sentiment. That's just very hard. Uh, the Western larger miners seem to prioritize jurisdictional risk today. Meaning we've seen, you know, Barrick has openly said, well, we would like to grow in Canada. But uh, the CEO also said, but there's very few opportunities. And I think Agnico Eagle said, again, there are too many majors for the opportunity set out there. There's too many players, you know, uh, there's too few big assets to go around for every major player. Again, going back to it's very difficult for majors to grow. First level thinking, uh, when you hear whatever, uh, Ross B or any, anyone or Alamos Gold say that, well, juniors are, you know, extremely cheap. Juniors are the cheapest they've been in 33 years or whatever. Yeah, so first level of thinking is like, I hear juniors are cheap and I think gold, silver is going to go higher. So I'll just throw money at gold, silver, junior, X, Y, and Z. I mean, that's basically what I see most of the time on Twitter. Most of the time. Oh, you know, this company has silver. People say when silver hits 50 bucks or 100 bucks, it's going to go up a lot. 
that that's probably very true. But still, it's like you don't know exactly when the sentiment is going to kick off. If it's a low margin producer, they might go bankrupt before that. Or they might have mined out their uh, ore body, you know, uh, without really making any profit. So when the turn comes, they only have a few years left of production. So it's kind of a, a, almost a worthless asset anyway. Nobody wants it. It's in a whatever poor jurisdiction. I mean, th there's a ton of stuff. I mean, no junior is created equal. I wouldn't... I mean, I think there's a lot of bias out there from at least if you just want to play the sentiment perspective. I mean, you could basically buy any shit co and that's going to, if it's around, it's going to go up. But that's not the way I want to go about it. I just want don't want to go into the best opportunity in, let's say, 33 years and just throw money at whatever. And it's like fingers crossed uh, that my shit co portfolio, that I will not get fleeced by the management. It won't go bankrupt. Uh, there's not a bunch of red flags that I haven't discovered yet, yada, yada, yada. On that point, that's why it's like you could fool, fool proof your portfolio by, again, follow the smart money. Is La Sonde in it? Is, is Rosbiri in it? Is, you know, Rick Rude betting on it? Is, I mean, I'm not saying that all of them are going to be guarantees, but like Landines and stuff or a major mining company. You're not going to be smarter than the smartest mining investors or the largest uh, you know uh, mayor uh, corporations let's say that are in the gold business so you can easily again foolproof your portfolio but it's like if you have 80 percent of juniors and it's like management doesn't have any skin in the game really uh management has no previous success the board is very thin uh, there's no third party validation by, uh, you know, smart money, big investors or a mid tier or a major. Then it's like, yeah, you better know something, you know, you better have a, b a good reason why you're in that stock, in my opinion. But that's fine. I mean, if you're like, OK, this junior has a bunch of gold in the ground. It's not uh, high quality at all. But I know that, OK, you uh, when this sector gets hot, these ounces in the ground will, you know, trade for multiples higher. As, as long as you're, under, you're understanding the win condition you have and that it is a gamble. You're, that's a pure beta greater fool bet. And, and that doesn't necessarily, that's not necessarily bad. But then you know that all I can do is wait for the sentiment to change. Doesn't It doesn't help you like bitching about, oh, why is this stock not up whatever it's like no the only win condition pretty much is probably just to wait for sentiment that's all you can do uh, okay so if i would summarize just the value picture we have this is the business value of gold miners at 2500 dollar gold let's say major producers are actually fair valued so they're not cheap they have a hard time growing, so they have a hard time looking cheap in the future unless gold price goes up. Is that a no-brainer bet? To me, that's actually not a very interesting bet at all. And the institutions are, are all over this. Anybody that's looking for exposure to gold or something, you know, the big funds, I mean, they can buy the Barricks, the Agnikos, the Newmonts and stuff. And typically, again, I mean, the bigger they get, the harder it is to grow. So they're shooting themselves in the foot. It's like Newmont. Yes, they acquired, uh, what was it, Newcrest. Like, okay, they're at 70 billion. How easy it is, is it going to be if gold stays flat that they actually deliver? Because they're eating up their future every day. They're eating up their future every day. So they need to find, I don't know how many ounces New, uh, Newmont produces, maybe 3 million ounces a year. No, I actually think it's 4. So they need to replace, just at steady state production, they need to replace 4 million ounces per year. If they, if they want to grow, they, they not only have to delineate and drill up 4 million ounces per year, they have to go above that, and then they have to put into production. That's a tall task. Mid-tiers, I haven't looked at too many of them, but I just assume that they're maybe a bit cheaper. And they still have an easier time to grow. I mean, Alamos Gold is... 10 billion dollars, not 70 billion dollars. So if they buy a good mine that's producing... 100 to 200,000 ounces a year that could have like a whatever you know 20% bump 
uh, to their value actually so so it's not impossible it's easier than for the majors but they're they're not super uh, cheap and they don't have the easiest time growing then we have the junior developers the non producing companies or exploration companies whatever the junior gold miners and they are trading down here there's a whole trough full uh, of them and they're cheap they are not reflecting the value of their projects at all not even close so here is actually where the opportunity is but the thing is most of them have trouble growing so again if you buy a pure beta play trading sardine at face value the business value might be up here and you're probably going to get a very big return they might have a very hard time growing though because they have a mature asset or if you're a junior explorer you have a hard time growing because it's so hard to find capital and the, the, the risk of dilution because nobody cares and all that so there's a bunch of problems with the lack of i mean that they are cheap is i mean if something is cheap that's the best reason to buy but my point is there are still differences in juniors uh, the opportunity is for buyers right now of course that's why almost gold ceo said well now it's he expects more m a because they are cheap so these people have the money the knowledge to buy these and put them into production they uh, open their wallets and buy because the retail sector is not opening their wallets and buying these up so they can step in steal these juniors put them into production have the value go from here re-rate to this when they put them into production then they have created value they are taking opportunity of this value gap here it's a buyer's market they are fair they might be close to fairly valued they're buying cheap projects put them into production they get revalued obviously again the problem is the bigger they are the harder it is to find assets that is worth their time and as i've said uh, if you're cheap and have almost no access to capital as a junior explorer yes you're cheap and you can't do anything about it you're powerless to do anything about it you can't create value if you try to create value you might actually end up destroying value because of the dilution if you don't uh, do anything which is very hard for companies to do nothing uh, if you're not doing that then you're at least you know gna and stuff i mean you have to you know you want to pay your salaries whatever so you're constantly let's say uh eating up cash and need funding just to be around so that's actually like an option but it's you know getting worse and worse in a sense even if you didn't do anything if you need g g g and a and again some untimely like big races whatever can kind of you know uh, almost destroy destroy the stock so it's very hard for g juniors because they can there's no capital they can put them into production themselves because they again don't have the capital so it's the acquirer that can do something with this undervaluation force it to reach a higher multiple they can take direct advantage of the current environment but if you're in juniors you can take direct in uh, uh, advantage of not only putting yourself in a you know project that might be acquired but also just waiting for the sentiment swing because yes these companies here with gold price going higher they might revalue but like the the reve the reversion to mean for the juniors will be much much higher than the gold majors and the mid tiers so th there's a you know i mean uh, very much merit of just owning gold juniors just from a revaluation standpoint since they're cheap but again just pointing out that there are differences so the question was what kind of company would thrive in this environment knowing that this is the playing field today this is what's going on right now. These are the rules, if you know, if I would put it like that. This is reality right now. Are some companies with certain specific characteristics better than others? Can we use this to our advantage? Instead of just being, uh, whatever, victims of it. Okay, I can't really, I don't want to, you know, okay, sure, the, again, the major miners, they, they have 
tons of cash. They can buy up almost every junior out there. Uh, but I don't see them having an easy time growing. And as Frank Ustra said, they're shy. So they're very scared to pull the trigger. Okay, mid-tier producers. They're not as cheap starting off. But yes, they can obviously create value by stealing value and then putting into production and ref start, uh, so they start to reflect the business value $2,500 gold so they can take advantage of the delta. So there's a uh, merit for that I would say. But they don't have insane growth profile, they don't start out insanely cheap. I would suggest that maybe the type of companies that are specifically attractive in the environment of today, exactly today, and this could change overnight, obviously. Gold could, whatever, go up much higher, go down much more. Inflation could skyrocket over the next 6 to 12 months. But if we're just looking at the, the, the context or what the playing field is right now, I would argue one could make a case that a company that fits and actually uses the, uh, well, takes advantage of the most amount of points here would be a junior mining company that has an advanced asset that is either in production or, or can soon be in production. Because regardless of the, what the sentiment for juniors is going to be, if you have a mine that's up and running, producing cash flow at $2,500 gold, that is money in the hand. That is not a developer that's like, well, uh, we should be worth this much. We're not because of sentiment and we can't do anything about it. We can't technically punish the market. In, in a sense, even though, yes, if it's really cheap, it's a buy by default. But my point is that if a mine is up and running, producing cash flow, uh, it doesn't matter really what the sentiment is. That company is getting that cash flow. So if you own the company, you're adding cash. You're taking advantage of the fact that gold is at 2,500 and the gold sector has really high profit margins. If a junior is going to be in production in eight years, that's when the you know their gold project uh, will start to get mon monetized. Theoretically, we don't know what the uh, what the environment is going to be at that point in time. May maybe gold is up at four thousand dollars, but uh, cost the uh, oil in sustaining costs are up at three thousand five hundred dollars. We don't know. We know that any producer. That's in or any company that's in production now or soon will be probably will at least for some time have a very favorable mining environment from a cash flow perspective. So if you would have a mine up and running now or would be able to get into production, you could enjoy the benefits of a $2,500 gold price because that's going to reach your bottom line. And then that company can do stuff with it, regardless of what the uh, sentiment uh, values the company at. Because if they have free cash flow, they, they necessarily won't need dilution. So they can actually go out and buy stuff, maybe. They can just bunker up cash and then buy something, get into production, explore more. Just keep increasing the value of the company. And sooner or later, that's just going to be a slingshot move uh, if, you know, the, uh, you know, when the market actually starts to price it in. So th that ha you can ignore the fact that the uh, junior is in production, but you can't ignore the fact that the cash flow is real. A team that can build a mine, obviously, can execute. That's one thing that's like the more I talk to people, the more present or companies I listen to, they keep talking about, you know, no, you have to have a mine building team. And we saw that with pure gold mining. Uh, apparently, I mean, from everything I've read about West Red Lake uh, or, you know, listen to interviews, the previous team, they were not mine builders. They had been planning on selling that project, not needing to go into production. But the, the company went to too high of a valuation, so nobody wanted to buy it. So the only path forward was to actually put it into production. And they... 
appear to have been, done a piss poor job of doing that, hence why they went bankrupt. So it kind of goes to show that like, even if you have, you know, a theoretically very well and good asset, if the people can't execute, if you don't have a mind build team, then, you know, there's risks. But there's risk always, but it's like more apparent risks. I mean, if you see some shit codes, like we're going to go into production, it's like nobody on the team has any real mind build experience. You should probably run for the exit. Has good backing and, backing and access to capital. Can be aggressive. Have some, again, some kind of backing. Maybe, you know, one a billionaire investor or something like that. Or a major uh, company. I mean, typically, I, I guess that you don't really fund developers in that sense. They're more likely to acquire. But any, anyway, just good access to capital. Meaning, if they have success, they can easily get cash and just start plowing and, and ho hopefully you know maybe somewhat of a tight share structure so you don't it's not just in the hands of retail and all that an intention to build and buy opportunistic which goes back to this taking advantage of the fact that junior gold developers are extremely cheap right now small enough that a 60,000 ounce of production you know gold product could uh, uh, be material value at low threshold for growth again you can say that about the new months there are plenty probably of pretty advanced f at least 50,000 ounce gold pro uh, production products out there that albeit that they're selling for one tenth of what they're valued at Newmont won't buy that Barrick won't buy that Agnico won't buy that the mid tiers probably won't buy that most companies are probably too large to care about the smaller assets. But if you have this combination that's like a junior company that is either in production or can soon be in production, has a team that can build a mine if they're not in production yet, has good backing and access to capital with the intention to build and buy, opportunistic, meaning being able to take advantage of that. Uh, and small enough that, so that means a, a, a junior in this case that fits these characteristics, a plan to build and buy, grow, they have a much easier time to create value by growing than mid tiers and majors. They have access to capital so they can actually acquire other juniors which are selling for one tenth of their MPV for example they preferably have cash flow or soon have cash flow so they can actually use that to acquire these cheap assets uh, yeah and that combined with you know access to cap uh, access to capital so I mean both cash flow and access to capital you know, maybe good at uh, securing debt if need be and whatever. But again, intention, intention to build and buy. Those companies would have the best pass or the lowest thresholds in terms of being able to grow. They would be able to take opportunity of this picture here to get it to reflect this picture here. So they would take advantage of this. Majors, mid-tiers products might be too small for them but not small for a junior that wants to become a mid-tier there is not a lot of juniors out there that fit this description there are a lot of exploration companies there are a lot of developers there are a few that have these kind of criteria i would say and maybe we should also actually listen to this, like uh, watch this very interesting interview with Agnico Eagle. And this is a segment, basically he, he talks about, well, he talks about a lot of stuff, but you know, he talks about the Agnico, the, when they're saying that they're regional players, uh, meaning they want, you know, big land packages or uh, regions where there can be a lot of, you know, there's a lot of exploration potential. Then they kind of get up, mine up and running, and then they just grow from there. So they start something up that starts generating cash, and then they just drill, drill, and drill. Make it bigger and bigger and bigger. I mean, they're going to be upsizing Detour, I think, 
soon to, I mean, they're aiming for a 1 million ounces of production per year from like 600 to 700 thousand. So they bought that already a big mine and they're about to make it bigger because they've used that cash flow to just grow and grow and grow. And they have a huge land package. They typically have a huge land package here. I think it specifically talks about their none of it assets. Um, there's tremendous potential there. So our focus is when we took it over, uh, it was a small mine. We put it on care and maintenance. Why to drill it? It's grown. We're working on plans to reopen it much bigger than what it was. Um, but as we said, the best way to create value is once you build the production base. So we're going to restart that at some point, probably announce something next year and then continue to drill. So there's tremendous potential. So I like hearing that. I mean, how basically Agnico looks at how do you create a lot of value? Well, you take a big fat land position, let's say. In this case, they bought a mine that wasn't that big to start off with. Now probably too, again, too small for Agnico. But they have cash from other mines, so they can just, you know, expand it, expand it, expand it. Then they restart it on a bigger scale and they just keep exploring. And maybe, who knows, maybe they will be mining in Nunavut for 50 to 100 years. But it's like it starts with what Frank Usra said. Uh, well, that was how you create a company. But it's like every mining company starts from one good mine. And in this interview, he goes through that in 1998, I think, Agnico had a market cap of 100 million and one mine. Agnico today is the second largest gold miner in terms of market cap that they started with one mine and a hundred million market cap or something in 1998 that was the spark that that the let's say cash flow production from that mine allowed them to then jump become bigger use that production grew there then jump add another you know whatever regional play and then just grow and grow and grow so with this in mind uh, I'm going to again uh, rehash some juniors I recently talked about. I mean, you don't have to agree with me, uh, but this is so far, this is basically the type of company that I think, uh, as things stands down, uh, stands now, that uh, basically uh, take, takes advantage of the dislocations, the high gold price, uh, high potential for upside and all that. So you can, again, disagree with me, of course. I mean, this is, I'm, I'm talking about how, how I'm thinking, how I'm, in, how I'm investing. You don't have to invest like me. I don't expect me to have the best performing portfolio. I think I'm going to be, if the Super Bowl starts tomorrow, I'm going to be beaten by somebody that's only in shit coast. Maybe somebody that's only in silver shit coast. I'm not looking for, you know, just taking whatever uh, big risks of you know having the absolute best possible returns in the entire sector i want a strategy that will work over time and that's typically value investing that's the only thing that's worked for me and i also want to be considerate of the opportunity sets the risk reward that's presented to me right now and again not just do a shotgun approach necessarily just buy just buying the highest beta because I know how I work when I'm only in pure beta as soon as there's a correction I get scared that I own something that's actually not worth much and I'm only you know riding the greater fool uh, trading sardine strategy and then I you know probably am gonna sell out because I feel like a dumbass anytime I own something that I, that I don't think has any value that's just how I'm wired that's why I can't really trade that's why, I mean, back in 2015, I didn't know that the things I own were kind of shit coast, most of them. Uh, so that time it actually saved my bacon. But if I would just, oh, okay, it worked then, so I'm just going to keep doing that. Well, I would have gotten destroyed because those very same juniors that went down 54%, then up 500%, ended going down uh, Great Panther, went bankrupt. Uh, Bear Creek almost, I think, went bankrupt, but it still went down 80-90%. So I would have given all of that back uh, if I didn't, whatever, you know, try to market time and all that. So I don't want to do that. I want, I want a strategy that's sound, based on common sense, and also really uh, hones in on what is the opportunity set. Given the situation right now out there in the markets, given the dislocations, given the price of gold, given 
the valuations of the majors, mid tiers, like where are you finding the most value? And within, uh, obviously that's in the junior space, but within that junior space, are there some juniors that actually can 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 uh, benefit from this dislocation, this, this piss poor retail sentiment environment? Are there some that can actually, you know, create lemonade out of lemons in this environment? Or, or is every junior, for example, just a, a victim to the sentiment in a sense? Uh, so it's like, I, I've talked about Integra, before, I mean, the last video, I think I talked about it a lot. So it's like, I'm not going to rehash the whole case. But, I mean, I just think about this for a second. I probably said it already. Uh, but okay, you know, at face value, assuming the merger goes through, right now I think Integra has a market cap of, no, Florida Canyon has a market cap of like 78 million CAD. <coughs> oh, excuse me. 78 million CAD. We can readily see here that according to the base case, Florida Canyon has an MPV of US 128 million at 5% discount rate. This is the base case gold price. $2,200 in 2024, $2,150 in next year average uh, in, and um, 2026, and then flat lines at $1,900 and flat silver prices of $20 per ounce. Obviously, the gold price is right now higher than US 2200. It's at 2500. So, what's the MPV? I mean, it's like this is, let's say, a somewhat bearish scenario. In this somewhat bearish scenario, uh, Florida Canyon alone has a CAD MPV of what would that be? Like 170 million or something? So, pretty much twice the, the price of Florida Canyon. If the gold price would stay around $2,500 and God forbid actually go higher up until 2027, what would the MPV of, what would the value of Florida Canyon be at that point? According to the technical study, if you put in 2,500, I think it's about 300 million CAD, meaning more than three times the market cap of Florida Canyon. So at spot prices, you're buying, let's say you can buy Florida Canyon for less than a third of uh, what it would be worth, according to the economic study, if these gold prices hold up. Uh, that's a pretty good situation. If they can produce, you know, around 70,000 ounces and we have a gold price of $2,500 and they have an all-in sustaining cost of like, what would this be? Uh, 1700 uh, goes up to, I don't know, 750, 1800 uh, two years from now. Then drops down to like 1525, then 1525, and then 1400. You know, you know what I mean? So, I mean, if, if we have a high gold environment going out to 2030, Florida Canyon is going to be worth a lot more than the current market cap of Florida Canyon. And there's obvious opportunity to extend mine life through exploration. The CEO has talked about, you know, the team thinks, you know, they could at least find 300,000 ounces more. So that's, you know, a, a few years of additional production, which would increase the value even more. And now if they merge with Integra, their market cap is going to be around, I think, $225 million. So at face value, you have a situation where right now the Florida Canyon mine is probably worth more than the combined end, uh, combined market cap. And the beauty with Integra in that case, assuming the merger goes through, is that they don't even need to go out and buy one or two juniors. Because on a standalone basis, I'm not too impressed by Florida Canyon. I mean, I wouldn't want to own a one mine, you know, relatively high cost operation with at face value seven year mine life probably maybe 10 year mine life but it's like okay you know they have to do something otherwise i'm just waiting for the mine to run out and hopefully i get you know two times my money back before that happens hopefully uh 
But again, the combined entity will not need to even go out and put in a 50% premium to these cheap juniors. They have two additional juniors. Well, I mean, if you look at it th that way, it's like Florida Canyon is kind of, you know, ac acquiring, I mean, it's more Integra, but it's like it's a merger, so you can look at it either way. So Florida Canyon is getting two quite large projects that are better than the Florida Canyon, uh, Canyon project. That's what they're getting. And then they are cash flow positive if these gold prices hold up and all of that. So then they can spend that money regardless of what the market thinks. They're going to be making money $2,500 gold. That's something I think we can uh, probably, you know, pretty much take to the bank. And potentially they could make quite a bit of money if gold prices stay at 2500 maybe they will be trading at a forward pe of like 3 or 4 of the in the combined entity and then using this cash cash flow to have florida canyon go up in value by adding more mine life by drilling out nevada north which has obvious exploration potential pushing floor uh, uh, pushing delamar towards uh, production, you know, through the permitting stages and all of that. I mean, again, at face value, you get two development juniors for free at spot gold price. This is one of the most ridiculous cases I've seen uh, recently. Because they, they kind of almost have the and they're backed by Wheaton and BD as well and they and they have a mine building team because they're you know buying a team that's actually you know mining you know heap leach gold and that's what their other projects is going to be heap leach gold as well so so they they have an even better situation because they don't even need to be aggressive and go out and buy you get two products for free at face value and you're even buying the one mine the producing mine on the cheap at spot gold uh, so this, I mean, you don't. I don't expect to see cases like this a lot of the time. I mean, I, I yeah, I'm happy to. I, I think it's Florida Canyon shareholders that are uh, dumping shares or something. I, I think they're making a horrible mistake, but I, I don't mind it. So it's like, I, I've been able to, you know, buy quite a few shares for myself and uh, family portfolios. This is one of the most compelling risk reward propositions that I can find right now out in the gold space and again these are just going to get more and more advanced and then they're going to go up in value because permitting in the west is so hard and they're going to be well these uh, this is permit obviously in nevada north is in nevada which everybody likes and then you have delamore in idaho which i think will get permitted and if it's permitted that's a u.s multi-million ounce mine and they have a huge pipeline of uh, projects in terms of exploration and there's plenty of exploration just around the current product so who knows what the actual value is going to be at the end of the day so i mean if, if we're talking a blue sky scenario you know you're buying florida canyon on the cheap at spot gold prices maybe they extend the mine life uh, by a few years so you add I, I don't know who knows let's say you add uh, 100 million in uh, value whatever it depends on the gold price obviously but it's like okay nice you know a probable value add just from that nevada north obvious potentially already has uh what does it have nevada north heap bleach so a two thousand dollar goal it's already at whatever 700 million cad in mpv and that's likely to get extended because there's some obvious expiration potential so it's like what's this project going to be worth if you if they spend like 10 million from florida canyon or something to drill this out let's say they're up to a billion dollars in mpv a two thousand dollar gold in in a, in a year or two well shit i got that for free and then you have the lamar which is the flagship project and it's like, and they're gonna be doing improvements in the feasibility study. So that's at what, like six hundred fifty million CAD or something at today's gold price. No, at two thousand dollar gold price, let alone two thousand five hundred dollar gold price, and they're gonna be adding the forty two million of uh, stockpiles to the feasibility study that goes from being a cost that they had to just move and not make money on to actually make money on it, and it's expected to be high margin ounces. So. What's the feasibility study going to show? How, how much is 
then I'm more going to be worth a $2,000 gold. How much is it going to be worth a $2,500 gold? Let's fast forward two years. The Lamar is like, whatever, set to start construction, let's say. And, and you have uh, a gold price at $3,500 or something. And you bought it for free in 2024. I mean, Jesus. Talk about a stacked risk reward proposition. Not that it's a guarantee, but I mean, yeah, if the stores align, I, I don't know many companies that could have a revaluations, uh, revaluation journey like uh, uh, Integra slash Florida Canyon. And it's not even, you know, super high risk because they're not even, I mean, they have two, three mines already. They have three, two advanced deposits and one mine. They don't, they, they've already drilled it up. Then uh, Red Lake, uh, West Red Lake, which I've talked about before as well. And it's like, if you listen to the interviews, it's like, they're basically, well, they want to buy and build. I mean, uh, Guster has said that he likes to aim for a million ounces of annual production. And when West Red Lake, assuming it starts up, I think it's going to you know, start relatively small, maybe 60, 70,000 ounces of production. But I think they're going to do a much better job than the previous operators. I've listened to a bunch of interviews and it's like you have uh, Gwen and, and uh, the CEO. They go through a bunch of stuff that the other, the pure gold mining guys did that wasn't optimal at all. So it's like if you add all those things together, which means decreasing cost, decreasing cost. I mean, I think they have a pretty good shot of actually... Uh, having this become a legit cash flowing mine and again imagine okay two thousand five hundred dollar gold even though they might only produce sixty thousand seventy thousand how much free cash flow is that going to be that they can use to do what you know agni quigle talks about get the production base up and running and then just grow and they have the row and deposit which is almost a million ounces of 10 grams per ton but that's they announced recently that given that that would be take a longer time to get into production, they're, they're actually focusing on, on this area. But yeah, because it would get easier to get that into production. So it's like, OK, they're already thinking about it. Let's say they make a few discoveries. Let's say two years from now, they're, you know, oh, we're going to ramp up the production profile to like two, 250,000 ounces at West Red Lake. And imagine what the gold price is going to be doing at that point in time. And imagine what maybe the jurisdictional premium is going to be. And imagine that they drilled up more drove and imagine that they made an acquisition, which they've stated. It's like, imagine what the, what the future value of West Red Lake, if, you know, Frank Eustra can do what he's done before. So they have, you know, if you listen to Bob Moriarty, he says he thinks Shane, the CEO, is, you know, the best mind builder in the world. I mean, he, he has some a good resume. Frank U stress backing. Uh, tier 1 jurisdiction, obviously. Uh, they're having exploration success. They're aggressive and all of that. I mean, this kind of is one of those that fits the description. The downside would be that they have, like, I think, 100 million warrants that I don't remember the price, actually. But hopefully that will be in, I mean, or let's put it like this. I mean, if they make this work, sooner or later it's going to blow through those warrants anyway. I mean, if it becomes obvious that's like, I don't know what the warrants are at, like, let's say $1 or something. It's like obvious that they get into production, they make it work, they make some discoveries. So it's, you know, whatever, trading it, you know, 300 million when it's obvious that, hey, this is, you know, a 900 million uh, operation already. And, you know, going higher. I mean, sooner or later it's going to blow through that fast forward three, four years maybe they have been able to take advantage of this thing so with their increased market cap they can acquire something that's still selling for maybe 30 percent of its value and then they can use the internal cash flow to put that into production because they're also the only mill i think in well the only independent mill in in uh, you know uh, quite some area so it's like i mean again the value of permits just having an operating mill permitted built mill in the west i mean that's kind of one of the rarest things you can have today. Uh, and then Borealis. Uh, uh, Borealis mining. Uh, top rated jurisdiction, they're obviously in Nevada. Okay, two year plan. I, I love it when it's like, okay, because they have a team that's like a bunch of detour guys. Uh, their board is, I mean, looks super great. They have the founder of Kinross Gold. They have... Um, what's his name, Tony McCooch, 
They have some other people that I forget right now. I think they have the founder of NextGen. Uh, if you look at the backers, Rob McEwen bought 17% of the company. Eric Sprott demanded to get a piece of it. So he put in 2 million, not huge for Eric Sprott, but still you have two. I don't know if McEwen is a billionaire, but you have two of the richest investors that are backing this place. So assuming things pretty much go, you know, go okay. I mean, they're probably going to want to throw even more money at it and they have the board and the team which probably are going to make very good decisions so two year plan drill to expand resource as guided by block model exploration drilling both proxim proximal to resource and new targets optimize Miller using on-site lab optimize balance of mining blah 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 exploit historic resources timing timing dependent on optimization studies prepare and permit for expansion targeting eventual hundred thousand years production so the thing is with Borealis, the project here in Nevada, great place, obviously. Uh, historic resource, H historic, it produced 500,000 at two grams per ton. Uh, federal and state permits in place for mining and processing, significant infrastructure, significant infrastructure, including operating ADR facility, mobile equipment fleet, open pits, 50 acres of permit, and currently recently producing heap, leach pads, and waste rock facilities. So this is basically a turnkey operation. Uh, they have the ADR facility. They have, uh, I think, they, I mean, they have basically, uh, they have, uh, 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 yeah, heap leach pad. I mean, they're producing gold right now, like residual leaching. This is kind of a turnkey operation. But the big thing for them uh, it's going to be expiration. So it's like the CEO is kind of branded this as an expiration uh, story, but they have stated they want to grow. And of course, then it might be a good idea to have these backers and, you know, the founder of Kinross on the board, etc. And Tony McCooch, which run, I think he ran Lakeshore and then ran Kirkland Lake, who knows something about growing a gold company. So that, and of course, you know, uh, Tony McCooch, Eric Sprott, they're both in there. I mean, they obviously <laughs> know each other quite well. So it's like, you know, Tony McCooch has, uh, I don't know, a bit of pressure. It's like, you know, take care of my investment now, Tony, says, you know, Eric Sprott potentially. And you have McEwen, who also is very familiar with Nevada. It was McEwen Mining that recently bought uh, Timberline uh, in, in Nevada. Uh, so, so these guys are looking to start production. It won't be huge scale, but there's two, two million ounces in a historic resource. I don't know exactly how much is oxides. I think we're going to learn more about that, but I think the CEO stated it's around maybe 500,000 ounces. So not a huge, huge operation, but still, again, they pretty much have everything built. They have huge backing. So if they start producing whatever, 30,000 ounces a year with these gold prices, I would expect them to make some good money, which they can use for what? Grow, drill, because this is a pretty fat land package and there's plenty of exploration targets and this is all undercover. And these are some highlighted... Uh, Sulfide hits, 67 meters of 16 gram per ton, 150 meters 4.5, 96 of 5.3 grams per ton, 67 6.1, 56 6.5, 24 10 grams per ton. So this is a high sulfidation epithermal system. Apparently the alteration is like huge. So it might be a very large system. Uh, these pits is what has been mined. But as you can see, I mean, there's like smoke all along the rim here and i don't think there's a lot of drilling in the covered sequences so is, is, the, is it a guarantee that they're gonna find a multi well they have two million ounces on the books but again the ore in the sulfides that's refractory so it's a bit tricky but there is a plant nearby could probably treat it which is where is it uh, the aurora mine hecla aurora mine historic production uh so yeah, I mean, okay, blue sky scenario. They, sooner or later, I mean, I don't think they, they're going to need to wait a long time. I mean, again, I think it's basically a turnkey operation. They have all the permits in place. They have all the, basically all the equipment in place, the, 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 
plant as well. Obviously, they probably require some capital to go back into production. But these guys, it, they could, I mean, start producing tomorrow, basically. And they're actually getting some gold from residual leaching already. They've already po poured three gold bars. So in this case, I mean, who, in a sense, like, who gives a shit if the junior sector hates junior i mean there's no junior retail investors these guys have good backing let's say they put this mine into production let's say they whatever produce thirty thousand ounces a year to start with okay i don't know what's that what that is going to generate in terms of cash but let's say they get whatever 20 million dollars or something uh, per year well, $20 million, I mean, to be self-funded for that, I mean, that could be a lot of drilling. So at the end of the day, that small operation could help them basically prove up that, hey, this is a very large deposit or they reach a you know, pretty good market cap. So they go up to whatever, $150 million or something. And let's say the sector is still shit. So they acquire some juniors around Nevada or whatever for like 20, 30 million or something that has an advanced product, but has no backers and no shot of getting it built. Um, you know, cash wrapped and all that. So in that case, yes, they would be the predator and they could kind of force the value because they could get into production. And there are very few juniors that can get into production and basically steer their own fate by getting the cash flow and then using that to, uh, you know, aggressively grow. So First Nordic is not uh, exactly the same uh, as these other ones. But I wanted to include it anyway, because it more goes back to the Agnico Eagle thing. And that's why I think they actually, you know, a big reason why they put uh, became the largest shareholder of First Nordic. Because if we hear them talk, they want to get the production base up and running and then they want to grow. Well, Agnico have had 55% interest in this area here. That's not a small area. The Borsele project is quite large. But... It was still not a, well, it was kind of, I guess, a dish. I mean, if you read some older reports uh, by Borsley Minerals and you uh, look at the presentation by Ignico Eagle, I mean, they have a shit ton of targets within the Borsley project and they're obviously wildcat drilling right now, some of these targets. But still, I mean, to go into a new region and, you know, the way they talk about it, we want to get a production base up and running and then we want to grow. We basically want to be there for decades to come. Well, then you probably still need a larger uh, land package, especially for a major the size of Agnico. And who knows what their size is going to be just one, two years from now. So First Nordic consolidated, obviously, the ownership of the 45% of Barsla and slapped on their own 100 kilometer long land package. So they have 104,000 hectares. And Borsla just happens to be right smack in the middle of it. So that would be the, let's say, production the production base that Agnico could then start mining Borsla. That has plenty of growth left, I think. And then they have a bunch of other targets uh, that belongs to First Nordic. Uh, so, I mean, in a sense, maybe I would... <laughs> Sometimes I wish that Agnico Eagle wasn't in it and you could actually start, uh, you know, build a mid-tier producer just from this district alone here in Sweden. Because, the, I mean, again, I talked about it. This is the Björkdal mine. They're making bank right now on one point, sub 1.5 grams per ton stuff. Barsley is, you know, pretty much twice, almost twice the grade. So Barsley should be an absolute cash flow monster uh, that I think fits with uh, Agnico's... Uh, criteria for having low cost operations. So Barsley is probably the best gold project that almost nobody seems to be aware of. I don't see anybody talking about it on Twitter. I don't almost pretty much see no newsletter writer talking about it. There's a few people in the forum that talk about it. And this project is probably better than yeah I mean according to Tash it's a top 10 uh, gold project in the world that's not 100% owned by a major and that I mean then you I think he factors in it's like the jurisdiction the probable high margin operation the growth potential and all that and just how sturdy the current deposit is because like Tar said it's already a mine but it's just not yet an Agnico sized mine but this could be an Agnico sized district an Agnico sized region 
but it's, this is absolutely I mean, insanely cheap on on if oh, I mean, well, I wish they would do a PA on it, but they can't because the Agnico are operators. But that I think, if Barcelona did a PA, I think it would blow people's mind, uh, especially given that you can look at the market cap today, like seventy-eight million CAD, and it's like, oh, is that reflecting? Icari, for example, has I eight hundred eighty million market cap. Icari is not that much better than Barcelona. And I would say First Nordic has more blue sky potential than uh, Rupert Resources. Uh, but that, that's, and they obviously don't own the whole Barsle, but uh, Ikari or Rupert doesn't have the, you know, <laughs> these uh, targets, uh, you know, these very large scale targets that uh, First Nordic has either. And obviously that's why uh, Agnico wanted to uh, become a shareholder of the company as well. Uh, oh, and then also next gold. Uh, that's also backed by Gusra now, and it's like you see this. I've shown this before. You have on the very first slide, uh, next gold, the next mid-tier gold producer in the making. Again, going back to this. Uh, in this case, they don't have an operating mine, but they have around three million ounces. I think it's one of the most advanced gold developers in Canada, meaning that I think there may be a year or something from expecting full permits. And that is not, that is a very short list of projects in Canada of that size that can say the same. Uh, and there, I think they have a market cap of 65 million or something. And right now they're actually drilling. They've already tried to expand because they, as they said in a recent interview, it's wide open uh, at depth and they got a pretty big land package and I think they said that uh, if when they build the mill here and you know put this Goliath complex into production I think they would have the only mill within a 150 kilometer radius uh, so again sort of like you know whatever uh, Agnico Eagle like get the production base up and running and then they have pretty big land package and probably some maybe low hanging fruit in terms of other juniors that you know would rather you know sell instead of trying to permit a mill and a whatever whatever uh, so the, this is a, a bit behind i mean west red lake gold for example is expected to be in production next year uh, these guys are not expected to be in production next year but they could be i guess an acquisition target if they don't start to acquire but i mean imagine they put this into production in I don't know, two, three years. And let's say again, gold is at $3,500 or something. I mean, I don't know what this mine could throw off in cash flow, but pretty significantly, significantly I think. Uh, where is the. Where is the. Yeah, 1750 has a net present value of 336. At 2,150 per ounce, MPV is 652. I think it's trading for 65 million right now. So that's 10th of the MPV at $2,150 gold. So it's selling right now, according to the P, I think it's a PFS study. Yeah, PFS study. It's selling for less than a 10th of its MPV value at spot gold price. Again, going back to, you know, why Alamos Gold said, well, I think, you know, you will see m and because it makes sense because the gold projects are just that cheap. Uh, is it a, you know, tier two project? Well, I, I don't know. I mean, it's at least hundred over 100,000 ounces. I think, uh, yeah, but, but it's still one of those interesting stories. Like, okay, if they have some exploration success and all that, then it becomes like obvious. Well, you put up a mine here, you at least have a whatever billion dollar mine and then you have growth potential plus. And it's like, uh, yeah, someday the market is obviously probably going to reward it quite a bit, especially if, you know, I'm thinking of the Thomas, Thomas Kaplan doctrine where he expects, where he expects, uh, miners in tier one jurisdictions to get a speculative premium to be a bubble within a bubble so you can kind of I, I i think sense a theme here where it's like okay this is the us this is canada this is nevada us this is sweden this is canada 
this is where the amount of I mean think about it, like how many undeveloped gold multi-million ounce gold projects are in Finland for example it's only one that's the Ikeri deposit Sweden, in Sweden right now there's only one that's the Borsle deposit this is the largest undeveloped gold project in Sweden which also has uh, uh, been designated to be of national economic interest to Sweden so it kind of says something and then you have uh, I mean go over to Canada I mean windfall just got acquired obviously there there are there are a few I mean there are there are several in Canada and the US but some are very far from permitting I mean some are probably f I don't know I mean some are more advanced than others obviously but it's like it is not a long list and let's say over the next two years you see a couple or a few of them get acquired so i mean all of a sudden it's like the already short development list for if you want to build a new you know uh, grow and build a gold mine in a western jurisdiction tier one jurisdiction maybe when shit is hitting the fan as well that list is super short super short uh so I want to own as much as I can of the future pipeline and, and preferably, again, going back to this, that in my opinion, it seems that a as things stands now, this would be the junior type of junior that not only would I expect to be undervalued right now, but it also has the potential to create maybe the most amount of value. And of course, yes, an exploration play can create value even quicker, typically. Absolutely. I mean, if you, if you just throw money at something and it's just a tier one deposit, they just drill and drill, I mean, it could shoot the lights out. Yes, but if I'm accounting for the downside risk as well, then I think these kinds of situations, like they're cheap from the beginning, selling for less than they're, what they're worth on paper, okay? So you bought them cheap, but then they can also not only grow internally, let's say, but they can also potentially uh, do what Alamos Gold said, like uh, abuse this dislocation that the gold produce are worth this much, but in the hands of the juniors, they're selling for this much. So they can, again, use the dismal sentiment in the retail ribbon sector and actually buy ounces in the ground for less than they're worth i mean if they would just let's say you have a company just start buying up let's say you have a good mine up and running it creates whatever a lot of cash flow let's say gold stays at 2500 goes up to three thousand dollars and you have like i don't know 70 million of free cash flow a year and you just go out you bought a bunch of projects selling for one tenth of what they're worth let's say so you kind of hoarded the few advanced assets, let's say, you bought them for one tenth of what they were worth, and you have the finance, uh, you have the means of putting them into production, you have the skills of putting them into production. So, when you do put them into production, they will be worth, uh, they will get revalued and then be worth 10 more, 10 times more than you bought them for. That's a s legit way of creating a lot of value. I mean, let, let's I mean, let's say you start with whatever, 200 million market cap. The mine you own is worth 600 million. Let's, let's just, I'm, I'm just throwing something out there. You also buy something that's cost you 100 million. It's also worth 600 million. I mean, if you, from the, where you started off, yes, you dilute a bit by like, okay, we're raising 100 million to acquire or you pay in shares or whatever. But still, from every 100 million dollar acquisition, you potentially created 600 million in value. That's five times of the original market cap you started off with. Just do that a few times. Take advantage of this. Develop, jack up the price, jack up the price. And then, of course, the more mines you have, the higher multiple you will have. The bigger you are, the more institutions will look at you. Then you will have even more financial strength. Maybe you're not, again, big enough to... Uh, needing the size that the legit mid tiers or the majors will need so you can still kind of scurry around and buy all these dirt cheap advanced exploration companies out there and just bolt them together i mean imagine it's like take it's going to be very interesting to see where any of these stories are going to be in five years
I would be very, very, very surprised if not all of these companies traded materially higher within five years. Materially higher. I mean, if you put in, I mean, think of some blue sky cases for some of these companies. I am absolutely not ruling out 10 bagger potential for any of these. I mean, for Integra, 10 bagger would be like $2 billion. Is that absolutely out of the question if they get, you know, all of these three projects to grow and they have three mines operating in five years or something? Absolutely not. $2 billion might be very cheap at that point. Uh, West Red Lake, I mean, they get, uh, 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 they get, uh, what do you call it, West Madsen mine, uh, Madsen mill, whatever, it's like they get this complex up and running, they grow internally, make a few discoveries, double the production profile, prove up Rowan, maybe make an acquisition, maybe in five years they're going to be I mean, they talk like, I think Frank Guster has said, like, you know, in two to four years, or maybe it was an ex-gold. But anyway, they want to grow aggressively is uh, how I'm seeing it, because they obviously, Frank Guster obviously sees this. And you can just look at, again, what McEwen did with McEwen Mining. He bought uh, Timberline Resources, super cheap. Uh, Pierre Lasson's Orla Mining, where did they buy? Nevada. They bought Gold Standard Ventures and then they bought Contact Gold. Who knows how that's going to... Imagine how much value that might create to Pierre Lasson and Orla. They are being the aggressors. They're acquiring these dirt cheap uh, developers. Contact Gold, I think, was bought for like $18 million. Let's say, again, we have, let's say we have a five-year runway of higher gold prices in real terms. And they put, you know, the Contact Gold assets into production. That could be worth multiples, obviously, of $18 million. Same with the Gold Standard Ventures. Borealis, fast forward, maybe, I mean, they've talked about, you know, they're, they're kind of close, you know, to, they already are looking at acquisitions. So imagine they get this, they, they turn on this mine within, let's say, six months. I have no idea how, what the time might be even sooner than that. Who knows? Uh... They have discovery success and they, you know, prove, find more oxide gold lances, for example, while they grew out the sulfide. So maybe they end up, oh, we have, a, you know, whatever, multi-million ounce sulfide deposit or system. Plus they have whatever production to, I mean, they were aiming, at, aiming to get to 100,000 ounces per year. And then they have acquired something. So I think they're trading for 70 million today. Imagine where they could be in like three years. If, you know, some things go, uh, come together. First Nordic, I mean, make a discovery or so more. And then you're already looking at, oh, you know, this could be a 300 to 500,000 ounce uh, uh, produ uh, production district. Agnico just comes in. It's like, Jesus Christ. I mean, I mean I'm, personally, I have no idea why Agnico just doesn't put in 100% premium. Jesus Christ. Almost nothing to them. They've already taken 30% of the company. They're buying a friggin' district scan land package in like whatever. From a mining cost perspective, probably the best place you can be in a tier 1 jurisdiction. Super low cost. Huge land package. Multi-million ounce deposit. Low, high margin gold mine probably. That's going to be, I think, at least 5 million ounces at the end of the day. Why, how they, why they haven't done that yet, I have no idea. Maybe they are like, oh, we, we need to see that this is going to be an agnico size deposit and then we'll pay whatever. Maybe that's how they, you know, uh, uh, I mean, oh, oh, because uh, there's theoretically, of course, uh, a future where First Nordic grills all these targets, find nothing more across this entire 100 kilometer belt. And then they have, okay, we have barsley that's probably three to five million ounces. In that case, yeah, maybe that would be too small for Agnico. But in that case, I think they would be ready to sell it to someone who wants to have a really good flagship project if you're a mid-tier or whatever. But what are the odds that they're not going to find anything in this land package? I think that's very low, especially you have a plant here that produced, was built from mine that produced 370,000 ounces. So that's kind of the threshold for success even less than that i mean 
where's Botnia? I think Botnia is here or something. And I mean, they're going to be trucking their 3,000 ounce mine material to a 30,000 ounce deposit uh, to Svartliden. So <laughs> what's the threshold for success here? It's like almost nothing. I mean, Påbacken is like four kilometers away from the plant. I mean, if, I mean, if you find a couple of hundred ounces there, <laughs> that could be worth quite a bit, uh, this uh, gold environment given that it would be very cheap cost and you don't even need to build a plant and all that. Yeah, I hope you get my point. The next gold, uh, yeah, so they're aggressively drilling. Hopefully, I mean, they can show that we get at least 3 million ounces here. It's like, if it becomes obvious that, oh, this is just going to grow. I mean, again, I'm, I'm thinking of some, you know, Agni operations where it's like, yeah, we just, we just drill and we just find more yada yada. Uh, so it could get fun, obviously. Right now, uh, it's worth a lot more than than the market cap. So I mean, I, I would, I would, I think it's a pretty, I mean, de I mean, it's it's not a, I wouldn't call it a tier two property, but it's like, it's decent. I mean, at those at these gold prices, forget about it. Yes, this would be again probably worth at least maybe eight hundred million, nine hundred million. Uh, would probably with hundred thousand ounce production and hundred uh, thousand dollars all in sustaining maybe 1200 let's uh, account for some uh, cost inflation and not everything panning out even according to a pfs study even though they are more accurate than a pa yeah i could see i could see uh, uh you know a good future I, I think maybe this is one that's a bit more unknown and, and you know they're farthest away from cash flow while excluding first nordic uh but yeah, I mean, again, just look at the market cap. I mean, seriously, let's say they get in, they get permitted in a year from now, you know, and West Red Lake has proved up there, uh, you know, proved up the uh, West Red Lake mine or whatever you want to call it, the Madsen mine. I mean, why wouldn't these, they buy this if it's, you know, kind of ready to go? We'll build it. Yeah, okay, it's worth a billion dollars at that point in time. Uh, we can fund it. And then we have another Canadian mine. So what are you going to pay for something that's worth a billion? I mean, more than 65 million at least. Um, so, yeah, I mean, obviously there's some shenanigans that can happen to the upside. And, of course, it is a PFS. So this is a PFS stage project, which is kind of rare. And they're not too far away from being fully permitted, which makes it even more. Right. Yeah, so I uh, uh, ranted long enough. Uh, it's like, I, I love this stuff. I, I love, th this is why it's so important in my opinion, especially at uh, uh, in bear markets, let's say. I mean, uh, I think we're all, we are in a bull market, but we're gonna know that, you know, two, 300% higher from here. Uh, but anyway, it's like, to think about this stuff to get you greedy. It's like, why am I greedy? Because I'm thinking long term. It's like, I mean, I get asked questions. What do you think about this stock over the next month or something or short term or whatever? It's like, I have absolutely no idea because what they're asking is obviously where, where is the price going to go next week or next month? I have absolutely no idea. When I look at the fundamentals, when I look at the presentations here, what's the value of these companies? What could happen in the future? What are some of the scenarios that could play out? Incorporate, uh, you know, my belief that gold is going to continue to go higher overall over the next several years. Then you come up with like fundamental value that is like orders of magnitude higher than what they're selling for. That's the only way I know how to create an edge. Look at some, like uh, Eric Sprott says, see the future early. Even Stan Druckenmiller, even though he's more of a trader, he says, imagine what the world is going to look like in 12 months. And bet on something, you know, where the future would be, let's say, materially better than, than today. I mean, yeah, fast forward some of these cases. I mean, if we, again, if we could just teleport ourselves one or two years ahead the all of these companies would probably look completely different than they do today then we ha kind of have to appreciate okay what's the likelihood that it would be even better that or what's the likelihood that the price we bought them at today is going to look very cheap in a year or two or three years from now 
that is how I can build a very solid long-term bet, a long-term case. It says absolutely nothing about where the price is going to be next month, well, next week, next month, next two months, next three months, whatever. It's just that if any of these kind of deliver on their plans, let's say, they will simply be materially higher. Maybe they, these are all cheap enough that if you built a portfolio just with one, two, one, two, three, four, five companies, 20% in each, I'm not saying you should do that, but I would say all of them have problem, probable margin of safety. Uh, I think all of them have five to 10 bagger plus potential over the next three to five years. Meaning that if one delivers, I think it's going to pay for the other ones. And I believe that more than one will deliver. I would expect four out of five would deliver. And then slap on what could happen if we go into a real mania in gold and let's slap on the jurisdictional premium, etc. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, again, super, uh, super easy. It's not, I am, I am as... Or I should say it like this. I know a lot of people are very nervous at times like this. And it's like, you know, because most people have no idea what they're doing. Most people don't even know why they're, they should win. They don't have any kind of longer term picture for any case, really. They just watch the stock price day in, day in and day out. They listen to some comments and it's like, oh, this could go up a lot. And they're like, oh, OK, that sounds good. I'm going to hold it. And then it goes down and they get shit scared. If, if you're constantly living in the future where all of these presentations, the implications, what they have for the future, if you just, again, teleport yourself one, two years from now and just think about what could have played out and then you compare that to the price today, uh, I think it's going to be very hard not to be bullish. Because the more the more the 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 more cemented that future picture is, the greedier you will get if that future picture is very positive. If I make a case like next gold, oh, I think within two years the gold price is going to be at three thousand dollars. The sentiment in juniors is going to have turned around. Everybody's going to appreciate uh, very advanced, you know, pretty much fully permitted projects in Canada with an MPV of a billion plus. Yeah, then I can see how I could make money on from, you know, a 65 million market cap. First Nordic, okay, they, they drill uh, poor back and then they drill Storyukdan and they drill whatever. It's like they have success, they keep drilling. It's like becoming obvious that, okay, this parcel is not the only deposit, maybe even, you know, they, they find something that's gonna end up being bigger than Barsle. The project is already right now, I think, well worth over a billion dollars. I mean, my spreadsheet gets it closer to like two billion dollars. I'm not saying I'm 100 percent correct. Let's say one point five billion dollars. They own 45 percent of it. And this is spot price. And they show and not only that, but like Barcel itself could double in size and then they could find more deposits like, yeah, yeah, I could I can paint a, a few scenarios over the next two years, let's say where this share price looks absolutely ridiculously cheap, even more ridiculous than now, tell them uh, uh, Integra, super easy, we got it on paper already, what their three projects are worth at lower gold prices and what they're worth at today's gold price, which is, which is a shit ton more than, uh, than it's selling for. So if I fast forward, uh, let's say three years, where it's like they have two mines up and running and... and um, uh, well on the way to proving a, uh, or starting a third mine and they've increased the ounces so it's like who knows they have like 12 million ounces on the books or something like that uh, 12 million ounces and gold price it let's say three four thousand uh, dollars everybody's screaming for gold there's a mania they have some of the bigger more advanced uh, assets in the US is 220 million cat gonna look cheap Heck yeah. I mean, again, that, that's the kind of stuff that gets you going into the game. Or gets you to stay in the game. Think, Always think about the future. Everybody else can look at the next news release. Everybody else can look at the recent trend or the current trend. Or, 
oh, it went up 5% or whatever. It's like that's a rounding error if, you, if, you, if you're buying the t future one, two years from now. That's a rounding error. Who cares if whatever first Nordic goes up two million goes up or down two million dollars per day? I mean that that's nothing. That's nothing compared to what the project is worth now. Two million here and there for next gold is nothing compared to what the NPV is at face value. Uh, what what happens if again these guys get into production and show that you know these are not one offs, for example? I mean who knows what happens if they. If they follow this sulfide material and they start putting out, you know, holes like this in a tight stock, I mean, you, I hope you get my point. I mean, I can visualize why I should be winning. I can visualize what the conditions are to win. I can condition uh, visualize what it takes for m many of them not to make it. I mean, if if they can't make money on this mine, I'm gonna lose money. If Florida Canyon is a shit show, uh, if none of the other projects, they find no more ounces and it's never for some reason going to get uh, developed, yeah, I would lose money. First Nordic, if they find nothing else and Agnico just sits on these great assets for an eternity, yeah, could get quite boring. Uh, but they have the project in Finland as well, though. Uh, if next gold, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I think they're going to get to permitting, but let's say they don't get to permitting or uh, meet your hits. I mean, yes. Yes, you could make cases for that, but still it's like if none of these companies put out a single additional news release that just sat on their products, didn't take out any salaries even. But like if they did absolutely nothing, just the sentiment swing alone is going to revalue all these developers. These just happen to have plans of actually uh, uh, abusing, taking advantage of this picture right here, and there are not too many companies like that. Yeah. Anyway, I ho hope you found it of interest. Uh, I guess to wrap up, I mean, this is what I I hope people would really start doing again. N not if you go the victim mentality, it's like a junior suck. And nobody cares about juniors. Boo hoo! Uh, my shit co is going down. So you're const you're just a victim. You're out there whining. I see people whine all the time on Twitter. It's like, oh, it's been four years. It's been whatever. It is what it is. What does whining help? Again, you should be proactive. What do you think the best investors are? Are they sitting and bitching about something? I mean. If you find something that's just so extraordinarily, extraordinarily cheap that you would be happy to put in like 20% of your net worth, should you be bitching about that? No, people bitch when they feel loss of control. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know why they should win. They have no idea uh, why they lost money up until this point. They don't even factor in the fact that this sector just shits the bed. Uh, on more, you know, on a lot of occasions. The whole sector is down, like the median junior, I bet is down 70% or more from the 2020 highs. That is, that is your reference point. If you've beaten that, you outperform. And go and look what this sector does when it goes into rally mode. 100% is, that could be done in a month or something. So it's like if you don't have any idea how this sector works, if you don't have any conviction for your cases, you don't look at the value, it's like you're going to be lost. You don't have a compass. You have no idea where you are. You don't have any idea where we're going. You have no idea why you should win. Of course, you're going to feel like loss of control and a victim because you are like, to quote James, the James Bond movie, you're a, you're a kite in a hurricane. You just go back and forth flying around everywhere and you're, you're just the mercy of whatever the volatility we're supposed to abuse the volatility we're supposed to abuse the fact that juniors are down here and if we can even come up with some we can concoct some junior case that's like oh not only not only are they could they take advantage of this they are so cheap to begin with so it's like i'm i'm abusing the fact or using the fact that junior or juniors are cheap but i'm also using the fact that these guys can use this for their benefit 
that is like again let's not do the first level thinking of just buying whatever shit goes like there's always a silver lining again everybody complains about oh the juniors have gone down for four years nobody almost nobody is sitting there like me barely able to sleep because you're thinking of how much money you're gonna make in the future that's the silver lining the peak of depression the last day of the bear market is the first day of the bull market so one can look at it and look at the previous trend, what has happened, and be super friggin' depressed about it. Or you could be one of the investors that know that, oh, right, I mean, investing is all about the future. It doesn't matter what has happened because that's already in the past. It's what's happened from here. And you're sitting there, it's like, whoa, this is the best buying opportunity in 33 years. So if I put in some work here, well... I'm probably not going to see a layup like this in the next 33 years. This is maybe a once in a lifetime thing. Are you going to be sad about that? I doubt it. Imagine dropping Warren Buffett down in a P2 environment. I mean, he would go absolutely crazy. Just buy the shit out of everything. And then he would create another whatever X amount of billion dollars. Um, hundreds of billions of dollars. Yeah, so that's about it. Consider me biased. You don't have to do, uh, you don't have to think like this. You don't have to buy the companies I'm buying. And of course, I own a lot more shares than the one, uh, companies than the ones I've gone through right now. But I thought this would be a very interesting topic because, uh, yeah, so that's about as far as I've come. It's like if, tr if I try to distill, okay, everything that's going on right now, is there a specific type of company which actually might benefit from this except for i mean majors where it's like you don't even buy them cheap to begin with and they can't really abuse this same for mid tiers or, or i mean yes a major agnique eagle buys rupert resources like whoa i mean a steal for them probably but still i mean is that gonna make agnique eagle be worth twice as much no or mid tiers even it's like if they're up at five to ten billion dollars already i mean it's not going to be super easy to get them to 40 billion market cap but a junior that's trading for 50 to 200 million could they reach a billion absolutely uh, two billion yeah not out of the question maybe three billion i mean the more time you give them so they have much uh, they have a much easier time to grow typically because they start off much smaller I mean, I mean, it's obvious. I mean, if you have a hundred thousand ounce, hundred thousand ounces per year mine, if you add one more of that, you double your production. If you're a mid tier, you're producing five hundred thousand ounces. You add a hundred thousand ounce mine, you're you're at, you added twenty percent of value. If you're a major miner producing whatever a million ounces per year, you just added ten percent. That's that's a hundred percent growth in production versus ten percent, and there's much more of those these smaller opportunities out there. Again, it's like it's quite limited for the majors. Yes, there are some cheap development plays out there, but they can just buy three, four, like nothing because there's more majors than there are big development projects. Pretty much. Yeah. Anyway, thanks for listening. Consider me biased. I own shares of probably all companies mentioned. Some are banner sponsors. Some, I hope, might become banner sponsors. Because uh, I would happily, you know, take them on. Uh, because I like their stories. Uh, uh, yeah, not investing advice. Don't bet money. You can, uh, bet, yeah. Don't invest money or bet money you can't afford to lose. Uh, don't bet any, everything on any single story. As always, I have no idea what's exactly going to happen in the future. I don't know which companies I'm going to make money on or lose money on. I only have probabilities put up. And that's why I own like 30 different juniors. I, I'm just more weighted nowadays towards... The new money goes mostly into development place. I guess that's the... Yeah. So I'm not investing advice. Hit the like button if you like this stuff. Bye bye.